Heavenly Father, you are our God, and we love you. We thank you, Lord, for loving us first. We thank you, Lord, for the church. We thank you, Lord, through thick and thin and hard times and bad times. You've always been there, Lord. And we know, dear God, that you are going to guide us through this troubled waters that we're in. Sometimes we get uncertain because we're human. But, Lord, we rest in your hands like we're supposed to do all the time. And we just ask, Father, that your will be accomplished. We thank you for opening up new doors of ministry. We thank you for the praise reports, Lord. For those who listen, dear God, from West Virginia to Florida, we thank you, Lord, for the giving that has gone out to Taiwan. And I pray your blessings, Lord, over those that work there. I ask you, Father, to help our young people, help them to keep a grip on their faith in you, help our children, help those who minister to them. Uh, they're in un charter borders, too. But help us, Lord, to practice, or, or at least to uh, err on this uh, side of safety in all that we do. And let us know, Lord, that uh, sometimes you show us that what's important and what's not. And sometimes it's doing these kind of things that we really learn in our lives or what we truly need to be doing and what not to do. I pray tonight for the particular people. I pray for the family of Brother Nate McMillan. I ask your hand rest upon Gloria and her children. Pray for Linda and Ralph and their family. Pray for Alex McGrew and for Sherry. I pray for Bud Henson and, and Diane. I pray for Brother Joe Whirl and Linda. I pray for Linda, uh, Lee Whitworth, that your healing will be upon him. Pray for Alice Huff. Bless her and her family. Bless Tina Williams, dear God. Bless her family as she's laid to rest. And bless Johnny Strobel. Minister to these, Lord. Bless our church as a whole. Help us, Lord, to win the lost. And help us, Father, to devise a way, dear God to uh, bring people to Christ. Use us, Lord, for your glory. Be with us this time tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's let them know. Please, guys. I'm sure everyone heard about the uh, situation in Lexington, about the, uh, they had a guy that fell within a house. Yeah, I saw that on the news. I just praise the Lord that no one was hurt or injured. Well, that's over. I know. I was afraid of it. I got you. I got you. So, everybody's following me tonight, right? We're going to look. i got to get my back back here so I can rest it. I'm older. And my bones ache. If I don't have something to rest in my back, I really, really hurt. <laughs> if you go get me one, maybe it won't be mailed by that time I get the back. I want you to turn with me your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. Now, what I'm trying to do as we look at the book of Acts is I'm trying to fill in the blanks of history. Acts is the only book of history in the New Testament. But it is very pivotal about everything that we do 2,000 years later. What I want to try tonight to do is to connect the dots, not just in the book of Acts, but in everything that goes on in church history. Now, we want to always stay in the Bible. But the Bible floats out into life, right? And so that means how we react, how other people have reacted, and how we all interact with what God is doing in the world, and how close, now listen to me, how close the church is to being in the center of the will of God. Now the only guideline that we have is the book of Acts. Only guideline. Well, I take that back. The book of Acts plus the letters that were written during the same period of time in the writing of the book of Acts uh, and Paul and Peter's ministry. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 11. Now, the first 15 verses is just a rehash of what has happened in chapter 9 and chapter 10. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that chapter, well, chapters 9, 10, 11 are so important that the Holy Spirit emphasized it three times. So that means he ought to look and hang on to exactly what was going on at this particular time. So what I want you to do is look with me, and I think we'll begin in verse 18 and read through verse 28. Chapter 11, then... We'll get back to some scriptures, and I might ask you to look up a couple of verses, or I might just tell you what they are and let you write them down and look them up when you get home. Kind of depends on how time goes. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God. Then has 
God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Okay? Now, the, all the Bible scholars here know what's taking place. The Gentiles are being added to the church and they're getting the blessings of the Jerusalem Council. The church council, as you will. Of course, the church was kind of broad and so it's just called the Jerusalem or the Apostles Council at that time. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch. Now Antioch was the capital of Syria, preaching the word to none other but the Jews only. Now how in the world does that work? I mean, what do they do? They just go to the synagogue and say, y'all Jews, you're not Jews, y'all go over yonder and, you know, play in the river or something. I'm going to tell the gospel to these people. How in the world are you talking about prejudice and bias? Isn't that crazy? But the only one they want to be interested in winning is the Jews. Why? Because they were a bunch of narrow-minded people. You see, they, they weren't understanding the events, grasping that the Gentiles have now been added to the body of Christ. Let's read on. Some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spoke unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Okay, so here's some Greek believers that didn't listen to what the Jews were saying, they went on and they preached to the Greeks, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what do you do when a Greek receives Christ? He said, well, you got to be a Jew, too. That was some idea of, of, of people thinking, well, you got to be a Jew and Christian, so be Jewish and Christian. But that wasn't what God's plan was. You see, we have to understand that what God is doing right here is he is dividing the Old Testament from the New Testament. Now, we don't have a book yet. All we have is scrolls and letters, but you don't clump them together. It's not a continuation of the Old Testament. It's a change, a transition, what uh, is known in, 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 so, in society as a paradigm shift. Things are being changed for a, for a goal and a purpose, and that is for the gospel to be open to the rest of the world and not just to the Jews. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then tidings of these things, now this is important, came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. Now can you imagine being fly on the wall? Did you hear what happened in Antioch? A bunch of Greeks accepted Jesus. Now, well, they can't accept Jesus without being circumcised, right? No, circumcision is a Jewish practice. So you can see what all was going on, but their decision is going to be pivotal and is going to be transfer, or, or kind of a transformation of, of, the, of the body of Christ. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad. Barnabas was sent by the, let, let me go back read that, which was in Jerusalem. They sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. But when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad. He encouraged them all that with purpose and singleness of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. Now wait a minute. He was sent by Jerusalem to find out what was going. But rather than turn around and go back to Jerusalem and tell them, yes, the gospel has been given, God sent him to go north to find Paul. Because Paul is going to be pivotal to helping these Greeks learn the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the beginning of the writing of his letters. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Much people added to the Lord. Then, well, I read that. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Why? Because Paul was the person that was going to witness to many people, including the Gentiles, right? God said that. So he brought him there to share the Christ with people that he related to. See, Paul wasn't hung up on the Jewish prejudices. He was at one time, but God changed all that. And for one year, they assembled themselves together with the church, and he taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days, the prophets of Jerusalem uh, came unto Antioch, and there they stood up, one of them named Agnes, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dark throughout the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Now what's important is what happened in verse 27. The Christians were called, or, or, or the believers were called Christians first at Antioch. Now the significance of that 
was a name change. They weren't called Jewish Christians up until that time now. They were known as the way Jewish believers, apostles, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, but now they had a name that was going to stick for thousands of years, and that is the name of Christians. Christomazo, Christomazo, Christomazo. That's a, I think it was long. Christomazo, which means the call. That's the definition of the Greek word of, of Christians. Christomazo, the call. They become part of the ecclesia, which is the call out. So you call the faith in Christ, and once you receive Christ by faith, then you call out and sanctify to live the holy life that God calls us to live. Amen? amen. And we all have some amens right there, buddy, because that's what's going on. Okay. Now, let me rehash everything that's, that I've got here, and I'll try to put it all together. I got a bunch of notes. We might not get out of here at 9.30 tonight. That's all right. Y'all ain't got nothing to do, all right? Okay. Acts 9, 10, and 11 tells the same story. Barnabas goes out to see Paul and bring him back, okay? He was sent by the Jerusalem council, and the reason he was sent by the Jerusalem council to find out exactly what was going on in the Greek world, namely Syria, okay? Now, you may or you may not know that church councils have determined the direction of the church since its inception. Did you know that? Not your head like a billy goat. Were you aware of that? The most important two church councils happened in the Bible. Now, after that, there's two other church councils that really were very weighty in what you and I do as Christians today. There were seven altogether that what you would, could call Christian councils, and after that, the Catholic Church was born, and the Catholic Church started holding their own councils and started making decisions that affected only them with the exclusion of anybody that believed any other way, okay? But here's the two. Acts 11, 18, the Jerusalem Council decided, well, if the Holy Spirit has been given to them, then they're part of the Bible of Christ. The significance of that is now they are part of the body of Christ without obeying the Mosaic law. They're not restricted to the diets. They're not restricted to circumcision. They're not restricted to dress. They're not restricted to anything that was connected to the Jewish faith. Animal sacrifices? No, 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 no. You could be a Christian now and you did not have to follow the Jewish tradition. Any questions on that? The second council happened in Acts chapter 15, verse 29. It was the same council that made a decision about what Christians could eat. Namely, they had meat that had been blessed and sacrificed to idols. And the question came, they saw these Greek Christians eating that food. Well, this bothered the Jews because God had said in his word, you can't eat things sacrificed to idols. But... The Lord has pointed this out. It's not what goes in man that defiles him. It's what comes out. What God has cleaned, man can't unclean. And so they decided that it was all right to eat food that had been blessed by idols. Okay? There really wasn't nothing about it because the idols were false anyway. But anyway, that was the decision that they made. Okay? So they had a new name and they were going forward now. Okay? Let me go on in my notes. So at this particular time, the body of Christ is beginning to be organized, okay? Always remember that the church is not an organization. It is an organism, okay? It, it, it is alive. Let me show you the difference, okay? Organ, uh, an, or, uh, an organism is alive. An organization is not. An organism has one head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. The organization has many heads, okay? And so you and I are part of a living organism, but we have to function in a way that is in order. Somebody read 1 Corinthians 14, 40 right quick. Google it, look it up, read it, and we'll get back to that in just a minute, okay? Raise your hand when you got it. Okay, so the church is beginning to be organized, okay? It is an amazing thing to see the church being formed. In Matthew 16, 18, at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? He said, I am you, the Christ. 
He said, if what you said is true, and upon the statement that I am the Christ, I am going to build my church. Now, Matthew 16 is the first time the word church is used in the Bible. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. And so the Lord actually establishes the foundation of the church. Who is the foundation? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've already looked at Matthew 28, 16, where the Lord commissioned the church. Go into the world and share the gospel. That was a message to his body. The organized body had to go into the world, okay? Acts 1, 13 talks about the authority of the church. You must believe in Jesus to be saved and be a part of the body. Somebody have that to ask for a while? Anybody find it? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. 40, read that for me, please. Let all things be done decently and in order. All right, now Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church. I don't have the time to tell you why there was so much disorder in the Corinthian church. But the Corinthian church was a church like you didn't want to be, okay? They had so much going on that was wrong. And Paul simply had to tell them that, listen, everything must be done decently and in order. Now, that's what I want to try to do tonight. I want to connect the dots and show you how the Lord organized the church to function as the church. And today, the body of Christ is functioning just about as good as the book of Acts did. Amen? All right, let's go on. Uh, Acts 2, 38 through 39 talks about the qualification membership. Receive the Lord, repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? Acts 2, 21 talks about membership in the body of Christ. Once you receive Christ and are baptized, you're a member. Okay? Now, we talked about all these in the weeks previous. You weren't in the pews, but hopefully you were home listening by way of uh, TV. Okay, so uh, Acts 5, 1, or 5, 1 through 11 talks about the discipline of the body of Christ, okay? The ecclesia. Acts 6, 1 talks about the organization of the church. It's beginning to be organized to a place that now deacons are appointed to take care of the needs of the members. Now, what was the purpose of the apostles? To give themselves to the preaching of the word and to prayer. But the deacons were set apart to minister to the needs of the body of Christ. And so we continue. Uh, Christ, chapter 411, is talked about as being the head. Chapter 2 talks about the body being apostles. Chapter 6 talks about the body being deacons. And chapter 11 talks about the body being made of the church council. Okay? Now, understand this. Every church today, at least in Southern Baptist thinking, is autonomous. So we don't call headquarters and ask them how we're supposed to function and what we're supposed to believe. Now, they do guide us in the direction we go. But every decision that we make in this church is made autonomously. We make our own decisions, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and the anointed leadership of the church. Amen? That's how our decisions are made. Okay? So you have the deacons, you have, you have the apostles, you have the deacons, you have the councils, and then in chapter 2, verse 38, you have the members, okay? Now remember this. Over in the book of Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy was one of the leaders, the spiritual leaders in the church of Ephesus. Now the church did not have a building probably until 200 A.D., so there's not a building now. They meet a lot of different places, so they had to have a lot of spiritual leaders. Not just one building with one pastor per se, okay? But he goes along and he talks about the place of everybody in the body of, the, of Christ, okay? He talks in chapter 3 about the bishops. Now the bishop is a word that means overseers. In the New Testament, bishops and elders and deacons are basically all wrapped up there together. Why? Because they are the ones that are set apart to oversee the spirituality of the church. All three of those groups, pastors, deacons, and bishops, or and, and elders and bishops, all those words are interchangeable, okay? Because they're anointed, hands laid on, and set aside for the work of the church. But also in chapter 5, he talks about teachers. He does not leave any group unturned as far as looking at their purpose and their place in the church. He talks about the purpose of the teachers. He talks about the place of the elders, which again is lumped again with, with bishops. He talks about the widows. He talks about the women. He talks about the young people. And specifically 
now, in Timothy, he talks about the slaves and how they are to operate in the body of Christ. Oh my, do we have to open up that can of worms. Always remember this. The culture of the day of Jesus and into the New Testament was everybody who was a slave was, who was conquered by the Roman Empire. You were conquered, you became a slave. And basically every Jew was a slave. Now, every Jew or every Roman did not own slaves, but the New Testament never takes up the idea of slavery being wrong. He didn't teach that and preach that people were to draw laws and say, oh no, if you're, a, you're a, a Christian now, you have to give your slave back. What he did, what Christianity did, was to change the culture of the world by making the, the owner and the slave brothers. And when they became brothers, then there was no burden. Does that make sense? And they did that through teaching the brotherhood of Christianity. We're brothers in Christ. You know, I may work for you. I may own you. And the Lord and the Bible never tries to change that. Now, some people criticize the Bible because the New Testament did not condemn slavery. But you've got to remember, the aspect of slavery during that time was a whole lot different than it was. If they had stood up against the Roman Empire, well, they all got killed. But he tells everybody how they're to function and their place in the church. There to be no partiality. The rich people are to love the slave and the slave is to love. And they're all to be brothers and they're all to take care of one another. Now, it took a thousand years or so for that to transpire. But sooner or later, we supposed, at least in the church, to have got the message, hey, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, that translates down to the laity, too. The clergy has no authority or power over the land except what is given to them by the Lord. We are all brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only distinction in, in the book of Acts between members is you had the clergy and you had the laity. Now everybody knows what a laity is. That's the people in the pews who are not ordained. And then you had the clergy, which is the people, which was the bishop, the elders, the pastors, and the deacons. They were the ones ordained. Well, preacher, now you, I've heard you talk about them. I've heard you talk about the council. Where does committees fit in all this? Now, Baptists are big on committees. Man, uh, uh, somebody said, let me, I can get this right. A committee is the non-willing selected by, or the non-committed selected by the unwilling to do the unnecessary. <laughs> That's kind of the way it is in committees. But where do they fit in? Now, we rely highly on committees. Well, here's my take on it. You don't have to agree with it. We function in the, as, in the body here at Providence as an autonomous church. We vote on everything uh, that pertains to the body of Christ. But the spiritual things are uh, decided with the help of the laity by the clergy. God gives us permission and you give us permission to lead the church who to witness to, where to go, where to knock on the doors, when to have revival, what, to, what preachers to have, what kind of music to have, and so forth, okay? Now, what the committees do? They talk about unspiritual things. When the committee gets together, you can decide what color carpet to put in the church. I'll vote yes or no, however I like, whether I like carpet or not, okay? But the deacons and the pastors should not have to take up their time deciding on what kind of carpet to put in the church. Let the committees decide on the unspiritual things that goes on in the church. Changing light bulbs, changing air filters. But the deacons and the pastors, they are giving themselves to the spirituality of the congregation. And that is what our concern is. Taking care of the body when they're outside, ministering to them when they're inside, and focusing in on building the body of Christ like the book of Ephesians talks about. Now, is that clear as mud? Anybody have a question? I can't believe you don't have any questions on that. So, we are part of the ecclesia. We're the called out body of Christ. We work as an autonomous group. Okay? Whatever happens in the body is done in order. And the things that are done is structured after Acts 20, verse 18 through 28 that we just read. We have the, uh, the one, the pastors, which is the bishops, overseers. We have the deacons. We have the church council. And those are the ones that really 
guides the church, spiritually speaking. And then we have the committees that take care of other things. Okay? That, that's just the kind of way it is. Okay? And like I said, the only distinction between the two is one is clergy and one is laity. There is no other distinction in the body of Christ. In no church. And that's, that's the reason I think that we are kind of like the, uh, uh, the early church. No questions. So we know that the deacons are important. We know that the pastors and the bishops, the overseers, the elders are important. We know that the church council have a very spiritual function to perform because they make a lot of decisions that move the church in one direction or another. And the church council is a little usually made up of the leaders of the laity, right? So that means the clergy and the laity are working together to move the church forward in the name of Jesus. Okay? All right, let me get back to the council thing for a minute. Like I told you, I wanted to show you a, a history of how things have worked and that has brought us to the point that we're in here. Okay? Uh, hang on. Find my notes. Okay. The first two councils are in the Bible. Chapter 11 and chapter 15. We know the decision. Okay? One, that the Gentiles could be added to the church without observing Mosaic law. Two, that they could eat things that were sacrificed to idols. That didn't defile them in any way. Okay? The third council is one of the most important councils that brings us to the point that we are today. It's not in the Bible. It occurred in 325 A.D. It is called the Council of Nicaea. Okay? The Nicene Council made some tremendous decisions but all of them gave direction to the church that you and I are a part of today. Okay? The biggest decision they made was on the canon of Scripture. Canon means book. Okay? You see, the Bible was not one big book like we have that we told the church. It was all made of scrolls. There was no such thing as binding the Bible. There are some crazy people today that think that the Council of Nicaea, Nicaea got in a room and threw dice and made all these kind of weird you know, gestures to decide what books of the Bible we were going to use. Have you ever heard of a movie called The Da Vinci Code? That movie is fiction, but it depicts just what I told you, that the Council of Nicaea did a very bad and very sorry job at choosing the Bibles that you and I hold sacred today. The truth is this. When the Council of Nicaea got together and decided what books were going to be included in the Bible, they leaned heavily on the Bible, or the books rather, that were being used by the Christian churches that had been used for 300 years. And those were the books that they included in the Bible. They didn't exclude one, and the Bible that you have in your hands today was the same Bible that the Council of Nicaea decided was part of Scripture in 325. So that's 325 to 2020, same Bible, same Bible. And they did it very prayerfully, and their selection was to look out and see what was being used. And they said, these are the books that the churches have. And so that's when they brought them together, and it became the Bible as we know. Okay? Now, several other issues that are just important, because all through church history, heresy has come up. Heresy is false teaching. Go back and read Timothy. When he's given structure and order to the church, he warns about people who teach false doctrine. Judy talked about that Sunday. False doctrine, okay? Well, there was a man by the name of Arius, okay? They took up the issue of Arianism. What he taught was that Jesus Christ was not divine, that he was created. Well, what did the Council of Nicaea do? They banded areas from the church. They called them a heretic, and they, they claimed that Jesus and the Heavenly Father were equal. Hey, sounds good to me. I think it's right along with the Bible. Other items that the council took up, they tried to set a standard date for Easter. Didn't work out. <laughs> it always floats. It's always based on the first full moon after the after the spring equinox and after that first full moon and the next Christian Sabbath is Easter. And it 
it always fluctuates, okay? Because they could come up with a date, so they threw that away. They also talked about how to consecrate bishops, okay? Was it a special way of form to do to make the overseers special? No. Nothing except what the Bible says about laying on hands, okay? Now, something they did that kind of puts tongue in cheek, they condemned the clergy for lending money and charging interest. That was forbidden. <laughs> for preachers to do that. I guess the lay people could do that if they want to. But preachers could not, okay? They also refused to allow ordained men from moving from one church to another. They said, no, you can't do that. You ordain this church, that's where you got to go and stay, okay? So I guess church hopping was something that, that you know. Now, they, this is real good, too. They also tried but failed to forbid the clergy from getting married. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. So, all right, so that was, the, that was the Council of Nicene. It's not in the scriptures. It happened 300 years later. But you could see the impact of the councils in the order of God and what he was doing in the book of Acts. Ordaining the preachers, ordaining the deacons, separating the clergy from the laity, giving jobs to everybody, laying out these jobs in the book of Acts and also in the book of Corinthians, also in the book of um, Timothy, and, uh, and, and how it just continued to flow through history. Okay? Now what really messed it up was the Catholics. They got in there and all the clergy started making all the rules. And then it just messed things up real bad. But anyway... There were seven councils altogether that you can consider real effective in church history. I'm just going to read them to you tonight. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them, okay? In 381, there was the Church of Constantinople. Constantine was the one who called the meeting of the, of the Council of Nicaea. Remember, he had became a Christian. At that particular time, Christianity uh, uh, ceased to be persecuted. And now the church was back to being organized, and uh, he called that uh, council to get the, give them direction in the Christ, in the Bible. So 381 was the Council of Constantinople. The fifth was the Council of Ephesus. The sixth and 451 was the Council of Chal Chalcedon. 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 I think that's right. And then 553 was the second Council of Constantinople. And that's kind of how things went. And that brings us to where we are today. Okay? Remember, there are three books in the Bible that are called the pastoral letters. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. And in those pastoral letters, Paul lays out exactly how the church is supposed to operate. He gives qualifications for deacons. He gives qualifications for bishops. He gives the, the list of the elders. And like I said, widows, women, slaves, rich people, all those things that he gives. And all of them are part of the church and how each one of them are supposed to function. Okay? Uh, and as I said a while ago, and I want to emphasize this point before I close, Christianity abolished slavery. But they didn't abolish it by denouncing it as evil, okay? They, they abolished slavery by getting all men to recognize each other's brothers. And basically that's where we are today. I want you to read with me 1 Corinthians 7, 20 and 24 as we get ready to close. So turn with me right quick. 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 7. Twenty through twenty-four. Everybody got it. First mm -hmm. yeah. Corinthians seven. Paul gives an interesting view here on slaves in the church. Okay, uh, they were there. People that were owned by other people. Okay, they were there. We can't deny it. And here's what Paul says about them. And I think this explains that viewpoint. And I think it's very important to put this point out. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. 
Now what's he saying? Abide in the same position you were in when you were saved. And so that meant that you were a slave to the Romans and you were saved, you were to stay in that position because he did not want you to go and cause anarchy against the government because just to get your freedom, there was a higher calling and the higher calling was Christianity. That Christianity sets you free. He makes that point. Art thou called being a servant or a slave? Care not for it. He said, lest I would care for it either. But if thou mayest be made free, use it right. He said, when you become a Christian, you become uh, free. That's good. Use your office to help those who are less fortunate than you. For he that is called is the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So really what he's saying is, when you're saved, you're still a slave. But your master's changed. Now, you may be owned by a human master, but you answer to a higher calling, and that is the master of the Lord Jesus Christ over the heart and life of every believer. Amen? Amen. Did not Paul start many of his letters like that? A bondservant of Jesus Christ. That's a slave. And he says, we're slaves. Let's read the rest of it. You are bought with a price. You are not, be ye not servants of men, Brother, let every man wherein is called there abide with God. And Paul pretty much leaves it like that. Now, I'm interested in your comments. Or your questions. One thought that comes to my mind is for you to become saved, you work for a job. As long as it's in the will of God, you don't have to change jobs, correct? Right. If you uh, are saved and you're working at a liquor store, first thing you ought to get on your knees and say, Lord, do I need to be working at this liquor store? And I think, and my belief, called if you're a good Southern Baptist, God's going to change your profession. Y'all agree with that? Okay. Yeah, He does change your job sometimes. If you're working in an ungodly environment, okay? He said, well, you know, I can't be a Christian in this position. But he doesn't say that you can't be a Christian and be a slave. Because that existed for hundreds of years, right? You can't meet people with Christ in an ungodly uh, job or situation or anything in a liquor store. You can still meet people with Christ in a liquor store. Do you think you can? They're not drunk yet. They're not drunk yet. So you, so you think that's a good place to quit it. Listen, I'm with you, man. When I first started preaching, I went to beer joints. I, I, I testified. I, I went to beer joints and preached the gospel. I was thrown out of places preaching the gospel. But I thought that's where the Lord wanted me. Now, I done backslid. I don't go to many beer joints. But I'm not at I can do it. I can still do it. So I agree with you. But I ain't going to buy the product. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there you go. But you didn't order any Crown Royal before you left, right? Okay, all right. Okay. You know, How many of you have preached the gospel in unusual places? John, I know you have. What do you call it? A street corner? A farm country? A strip club? I don't know. What are, you know, where the gospel is not expected to be preached. What about, what about Florida Congress? Gospel ain't never preached there. I did bring it to my main supervisor when I was up on the clock. I walked in off the clock at Walmart, and I saw the supervisor I was supposed to. I talked to him for I was on the clock. Correct. That's correct. Ready to receive the thing to see. Anybody else?